Um, this morning actually is going to kick off a five-part series called Living the Better Life. So for the next five weeks, starting today, we're going to be talking about living the better life. And so uh, today is part one, coming alive in Jesus Christ. And we're going to be talking, obviously, about Easter, Resurrection Sunday, and then for the next four weeks, uh, more about living the better life. So uh, let's just get right into it this morning. The night before Jesus was crucified, that's this few days ago now, the night before Jesus was crucified, he made a very strange statement that nobody uh, who heard it really understood. That even the people that spent the most amount of time with Jesus didn't understand it. He said, and you can find this in John 14, 19, he said, in a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you're going to see me because I am alive and you're about to come alive. Now, what did he mean by that? They're thinking, we're already alive. Like, we're eating, we're breathing, we're walking with you. We're already alive. So what does he mean when he says, you're about to come alive? Listen, Easter is all about coming alive. Jesus Christ proved that he was who he said he was. He said, I am God. I'm going to let them kill me on a cross. I'm going to be buried in the ground for three days. And then I'm going to bring myself back to life to prove that I am who I say I am. And so then he walked around Jesus and uh, walked around Jerusalem, and every time, every time since then, history has been split into A.D. and B.C., right? B.C., A.D. Every time you say 2018, you're really referring to Jesus Christ because he's the one that set that, that standard, that mark. Almost everybody knows that part of the Easter story. What most people don't know is the second part of the story. And that involves you. That involves me. And it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he, and talking about Jesus here, he included everyone in his death so everyone could be included in his life. A far better life than people lived on their own. What is the better life? What is the better life, we might ask. Well, in South Florida, we know a lot about the good life, right? We have the beach and we have the sunshine most of the time. We also have hurricanes, not so good. But we know a lot about the good life, right? In fact, you're probably living some form of the good life. You've got a good home or you've got a good job or you've got a, a family or you're probably in good health and you'd say, I've got it good. And you're right. Compared to the rest of the world, uh, truthfully, we've all got it good. So we're living the good life. You're living the good life. But what if, what if there were something more than that? What if there were something beyond the good life? What if there was a better life? What if you were missing out on something that you didn't even know about? What if God had intended more for your life than for you than just living the good life? Wouldn't you want to know about that? Wouldn't you want somebody to tell you about that? Of course you would, and so would I. We often in life settle for less because we don't know that there's anything better. You know, when I was a baby, my parents, and you probably have similar stories. When I was a baby, my parents, they fed me pureed vegetables. That's what, that's what babies get, right? Pureed vegetables and fruits and all those kinds of things. And as a baby, I loved pureed vegetables. I loved them. I didn't know any better, right? And now, now, of course, today we think it tastes like garbage, but then we loved that. That was good for us. And then when we get to grade school, and when I got to grade school, I discovered SpaghettiOs, spaghetti and meatballs, right? And so we loved SpaghettiOs. My mom had this little thermos, and she would pack my SpaghettiOs in the thermos, and I'd go to school, and all the other kids are eating sandwiches, and I've got my hot SpaghettiOs, right? I loved it. And then as a teenager, there's this place called Chick-fil-A that came on the scene. And Chick-fil-A, you know, now we're talking, right? Now we're living the good life. We've got, there, there's definitely something better in life, right? Chick-fil-A, of course. And, you know, and today, as an adult, you and I, we've tasted, most of us have at some point tasted really good foods. I love a good filet steak, right? So because you know, we, we've tasted all these good things, we would never go back to those pureed vegetables, right? Why? Because we've tasted something better. We, we don't really want, you know, sometimes maybe nostalgia gets the better of us and we want to go back to those spaghetti and meatballs, but then we remember, no, we don't want to go back to those spaghetti and meatballs, right? But, but we, we've tasted something better, and so we don't want to go back to those things. Today, I believe that God brought you here to Morningside Church on Easter Sunday so that he could let you in on a little secret, and it's this, there's something better. There's something better. There is way more than just the good life, and he wants you to know that this morning. You were made for more than 
than just the good life. You were made for more than just looking good or feeling good or having the good things in life. That's okay, but there is so much more to this life. You see, beneath the image of this good life are three dirty little secrets that nobody ever really wants to talk about. We live the good life, but there's these three little things that kind of lie underneath of that that people don't really want to talk about. One is people feel exhausted all the time. It's exhausting trying to keep up with the good life. This isn't on your notes, but you can write it in the margin if you want to have it. So living the good life, you, try, you're, you feel exhausted. I'm tired all the time. People say, how's it going? Oh, I'm so tired. I'm so worn out. I can't keep up the pace. I'm overloaded. I'm overwhelmed. When I get home in the evening, I crash and I just collapse. And exhaustion always leads to the second thing that nobody ever talks about, which is emptiness. Exhaustion leads to emptiness. You say, you know what? I don't think I have another thing in me. I couldn't sign up for another thing. I couldn't take on another assignment. I can't take on another project. I can't take on another commitment. I am just stretched to the limit, and I'm empty inside, even though I've got all these things to do. And in those quiet moments, we're thinking, if this life is so good, if this is the good life, then how come I'm still unsatisfied? If it's so good, why am I not satisfied? And then emptiness leads to what I call enslavement. So exhaustion, emptiness, and now enslavement. I can't count the number of times that people have said to me, Scott, I feel trapped. I feel trapped by my debt. I feel trapped by my relationship or by my marriage. I feel trapped by the expectations of the people around me. I feel trapped by guilt or by fear or by anger or by unforgiveness or bitterness. I'm even a slave to my schedule. Ever feel that way? Trapped by your schedule? A slave to your schedule? Does anybody, and maybe it's just me, but does anybody ever experience that? Emptiness, exhaustion, feeling trapped? Yeah, all the time. It's the world we live in. But I've got good news for you today. There's an antidote to all of that. It's called the better life. The reason that God brought you here today is so that you could learn about the better life. There is something more and you're about to come alive. What's, what's this better life that Jesus Christ offers us on Resurrection Sunday? It's three things this morning, and I'm going to be quick. I'm, I promise I'm going to try at least, okay? One, it's a life filled with meaning. A life filled with meaning. I'll be blunt. The good life is not good enough. The good life is just not good enough. Looking good, feeling good, having all the good things in life, that's just not enough to make you happy. It's not. If you've tried it, you know. You've been there. You've done that. If it were enough to have all the good things in life and having, having good and feeling good and looking good and looking perfect and all that stuff, if that were true, if that were enough, then Hollywood would be the most happy place on earth, right? But it's not. In fact, the divorce rate in Hollywood, in, in the, that Los Angeles area, is higher than any other place in the world. Because it takes more than money. It takes meaning to have significance in your life. It takes meaning to have fullness in your life. A lot of people confuse a full life with a meaningful life. They're not the same thing. A full life and a meaningful life are not the same thing. Having a full schedule is not the same thing as having a fulfilled life. You need meaning in your life. I need meaning in my life. So we search for, for meaning through all kinds of things. We search for meaning through, through hobbies or through sports or through travel or through relationships or sex or food or whatever it is. Listen, these are all good things. God gave them to us. They're all good things. They just don't last, right? You've experienced that. You know they don't last. You need something that gives you constant meaning eternal meaning. So where do we get that? Where do you get that? There's only one place. You get that from the God who created you. The Bible says in Colossians, Christ gives meaning to your life. The writer of Colossians says Christ gives meaning to your life. Until you understand that you were made by God and you were made for God, life is not going to make sense. And until you understand the purpose that he put you here on earth for, you can't step up from the good life to the better life. The Bible says in 1 Peter, Peter writes, because Jesus was raised from the dead, and that's what Easter is all about, right? Jesus was raised from the dead. We've been given a brand new life. We have everything to live for, including a future in heaven, and that future starts tomorrow? No, that future starts now. This verse tells us that the better life is directly related to Jesus' resurrection. 
Jesus says, you know all those stupid things that you've done in the past that you regret, that you wish you hadn't done, or the things you wish you could have done differently, dumb decisions, bad mistakes, sins, faults, failures, all those things? He says, you know what? Let's just erase all of that and start over, and let's start over now. Let's start over today. I'll just begin a brand new life, Jesus says. I'll help you begin a brand new life. Step up from the good life to the better life. We'll wipe out all that other stuff and you can begin again. So no more guilt, no more guilty conscience. It's all wiped out by Jesus when we start over again with him. And you say, you know what? That sounds pretty good. How do I get it? How does that work? Well, the first thing is you don't earn it. There is nothing you can do to earn it. You cannot work for a better life. You can work for a good life. You can work to get all kinds of things. You can work to achieve certain statuses and, and levels in life, but you cannot earn the better life. You cannot buy the better life. In fact, it says in that verse, we've been given, right? Not you've worked hard for it. We've been given a brand new life. It's a gift to you. It's not, it's not earned. And there's a big difference between in life. When you're looking for meaning, there's a big difference between living, between, I'm sorry, I'm getting, getting mixed up here, between having something to live for and having something to live on. There's a big difference between the two. What you live on is the good life, okay? What you live on is the good life. What you live for, or maybe I should say who you live for, is the better life. You weren't made to live for you. You were made to live for God. When you start living for God, you discover real happiness and real meaning and real significance and real purpose and real value for your life. The beginning of a better life begins when you stop living for you and you start living for God. The Bible says Jesus died, that's, he died, so we would no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died for us and was raised to life for our sake. When you live for God, when you're plugged into God, that gives your life meaning. That gives your life value. That gives you significance in the world around you, and it gives you a purpose, and it gives you a real sense of wealth that is priceless. This better life, though, isn't just filled with meaning. It's a life freed by grace. The better life is a life that is filled with meaning and freed by grace. The Bible says this, Paul writes in Romans, we're free to live a new life in the freedom of God. Now, Paul would know something about this. Paul was the persecutor of Christians. Paul was the guy going out and having Christians stoned and killed. And God got a hold of his life. Jesus spoke to him and, and it changed his life forever. And he knows something about the new life. He writes, we're free to live a new life in the freedom of God. It all comes by grace. Well, what is grace, you might say? I've not been to church before. I don't know. I just came to church because it's Easter and I've decided this year I better try it, right? What is grace? Grace is when God gives you what you need, not what you deserve. Grace is when God gives you what you need, not what you deserve. Everything you have, everything you have in your life is because of God's grace. The next breath that you take, that's a gift of God's grace. If God didn't want you to take that breath, your heart would have stopped a long time ago. Your whole life you owe to the grace of God. You have nothing if God hadn't decided to make you. So grace is saying, I love you. Grace is Jesus or God, both the same person, saying, I love you. I forgive you even though you can't earn it. I forgive you. Grace is saying, I'm not mad at you. I'm not holding a grudge because Jesus Christ has taken your sin on the cross. Grace is God saying, you know what? I'm going to give you a second chance. I'm going to give you a third chance and a fourth chance and a 25th chance and a 100th chance so that you can be set free and experience the better life. You know, we Americans, we love our freedom, right? Jesus, we talk about Jesus came to set us free from sin and all that. Look, we should appreciate that. As Americans, we love our freedom. But Jesus, listen, Jesus gives us even more freedom than what we experience here in the United States. Freedom from what? First, he gives you freedom from guilt. All the things that you feel guilty about, he wipes all those things out. He sets you free from the fear of death. I'm not afraid to die. Why? Because I know God personally, and I have a relationship with him, and I know where I'm going. So he sets you free from, from the fear of death. He sets you free from the hurts that other people cause you. 
the bitterness that you, you can't let go of. He sets you free from that. The bitterness and the anger that you keep holding on to, he'll help you let, you let it go. He sets you free from expectations. He sets you free from yourself. He sets you free to grow and develop and to become all that God created you to be in the first place. How about this one in the world we live in? He sets you free from worry. A lot of people worry, right? He sets you free from worry. He sets you free from anxiety. He sets you free from the fear and, and the boredom and the meaninglessness and, and, and free from, from no purpose. Jesus sets you free from trying to earn God's approval. There's a lot of religions like that, right? You have to do this. You have to do that. You have to earn God's approval. Jesus sets you free from that. Does God like you? Well, maybe you're unsure about that if you don't understand grace. Some of you maybe were re raised in a religious home. Some of you maybe were raised in a very strict religion. Every religion in the world can be summarized by one of two words. Do or done. Every religion in the world is summarized by one of two words, do or done. And they basically say this, most of the religions in the world say, here's what you have to do to earn your way to heaven. Here's what you have to do to get to know God. And then they have their own different lists of do's and don'ts and do this and do that or do a little bit of this and a little bit of that and all these different things that you have to do. And they say, if you do all these things, then God will like you and you guys will be cool You'll be homies and everything will be good, right? No, it's not how it works. Jesus Christ came to earth to say, that's all wrong. That's not how it works. That's not it. Jesus says, I'm not into religion. I want you to have a relationship with me. That's why you were created in the first place, to walk with God, to talk with God. That's what Adam and Eve did in the garden before that sin broke that relationship. They walked and talked with God every single morning. And when they messed it up, God said, I've got to have a plan. I've got to restore that relationship, not that religion. I've got to restore that relationship because I created them to have a relationship with them. So God says, you know what? I did that. I did that for you through my son, Jesus Christ. You don't have to do anything. You just have to accept what I've already done on the cross. That's called grace. There are two paths that you can choose in life. One is to spend the rest of your life trying to earn God's approval by your effort, by the things that you do, by, by trying to accomplish enough things, by trying to be good enough, not kind enough, and all those things. The other path is to enjoy God's approval by accepting what Jesus Christ has already done for you. You just accept the gift. That, the first way doesn't work. You can't do enough. You can't earn enough. The Bible says it doesn't work that way. Hebrews chapter 7 even tells us the old system, and that's the old system from the Old Testament of trying to earn your way to God and do enough good things. And if you mess up, you had to go do certain rituals, and you had to go outside the camp for X amount of time and all these different things. He says the old system was canceled because it didn't work. It was weak and useless for saving people. It never made anyone really right with God, but now... The writer of Hebrews says, Now we have a far better hope for Christ, that's Jesus, Christ makes us acceptable to God. He said, I just canceled the old system. Listen, when a TV program doesn't work, it's not getting the ratings that it needs to have, what do they do with it? They cancel it, right? When a product doesn't work in the stores, on the shelves, and it's not getting the, the, the sell-through that it needs to have, what do they do with that product? They cancel it. They discontinue it. They pull it off the shelves. God canceled the idea of you trying to earn your way into heaven. Why? Because it doesn't work. Heaven is perfect, and, and as you may already know, you're not. I'm not. There is no way that you're ever going to earn your way into heaven. It just doesn't work. God said there is only one way to heaven and there's only one way to get the better life and that is to accept my free gift of grace, my free gift of love and what Jesus has done for you on the cross and conquering sin and death through the grave. The better life is a gift. It is a free gift from God. It's not cheap. Sometimes we think gifts are cheap, especially when they fall apart the next day, right? But listen, this gift is not cheap. It's free 
And a lot of times we equate free with being cheap, but this is not the case here. It's a free gift, but it's not cheap. Somebody had to pay for that gift. It was a very expensive gift. And you know who paid for it? Jesus Christ. He paid for it with his life. Jesus paid for your salvation. He paid so that you could live the better life. He paid for your freedom. The Bible says in 1 Timothy, he gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. He paid for you. He purchased your freedom. He gave his life to purchase that freedom. On the cross, Jesus paid for your freedom and for my freedom so that you're no longer a slave to guilt. You're no longer a slave to worry. You're no longer a slave to fear or to your schedules or the pressures of the past or to the expectations of the future. He paid to set you free. And there's a word for this that we don't really use very much anymore, but actually, as I was listening and worshiping with you guys this morning, I heard this word in one of the songs that we sang. He paid, he, he, the word that, that we don't really use a whole lot anymore is a word called redemption. There was a word called, that said redeemed in one of the songs that we sang. The word is redemption. To be redeemed means to have your freedom paid for. That's what it means. The reason we don't necessarily use this word a whole lot anymore is because it's a word that was associated with the slave trading years. And in the slave trading years, people would intentionally buy slaves in order to set them free. Did you know that? There were people who would intentionally buy slaves just so that they could set them free. And those people, what do you think they were called? They were called redeemers. The people that purchased those slaves and set them free were called redeemers. They would redeem a slave. Someone would say, you know what? Slavery is wrong. Slavery is evil. This person deserves to be set free. So they would buy that person, and they would buy that person's freedom, and then they would let them go. That person, that slave, was now redeemed. Jesus Christ came to redeem you. Jesus Christ came to set you free from all the things that keep you hung up, all the things that entrap you, all the things that enslave you. He said, I'm buying your life back from Satan. I am purchasing your freedom, and I am setting you free from the hurts and the habits and the hang-ups and all the things that mess up your life. He says, I want to set you free from it all. I want to give you a new life. I want to give you freedom. I want to give you a better life. So if I accept this better life, if I step up from the good life to the better life, what do I do with the old life, the exhausted, empty, enslaved life? Well, look what the Bible says to do in Romans. Paul writes, the best thing to do is give it a decent burial and get on with your new life. Give it a decent burial and get on with your new life. I I love this because it reminds me of my dad. There were a couple times as a teenager I messed up really big really big. And trust me, I got my punishment. I got my discipline, you know, to set me straight and get me back on the right path. But I was the type that I held on to things. I lingered and I held on to things. And I would go back a week or a month or two months later, Dad, I'm still, I feel so bad that I broke your trust. Dad, I feel so, and, and, and he would look at me and he'd say, let it go. It's in the past. We dealt with it. He would actually say to me, bury it, Scott. Get rid of it. And that's the same thing that Jesus tells us to do through his word. The best thing to do is give your old life a decent burial and get on with your new life. Don't try to hold on to that old stuff that had all the worry in it, all the bitterness in it, all the guilt in it with no purpose. Why would you want to hold on to that? He would look at me and say, why do you want to keep holding on to this? I already said it's okay. I already forgave you, son. And that's what Jesus says to us. If someone gives you a new coat, for example, brand new coat, you know, really expensive, I don't know, think of something. I I can't think of any name brands or whatever, but they give you an expensive coat, right? And you've got a holy coat. It's got moth holes in it, and, uh, you know, it's 20, 30 years old, and and I know some of you still have those in your closet because you don't like to clean anything out, right? Um, But but what happens? You, You put that old coat on, and somebody gives you a new coat. Well, you don't put the new coat over the old coat, do you? You just throw away the old coat that's all torn up, that the pockets are falling apart and the, everything's a mess. You, you throw the old coat away and you put the new coat on. Jesus gave a symbol for this in Scripture. It's called baptism, something we're going to do after our second service, at the end of the second service. 
the way they used to do it in Bible times is they'd go down to a river. Now we have this, and it's nice and heated. And I trust me, the Jordan River is about 60 degrees. It is cold. I've been in it. This is like 90 degrees, way better, right? But the way they used to do it then is they'd go down to the river and they would dunk a person completely under the water and they would bring them back up. Now, why would they do that? Why do we put people down under the water and bring them back up? What's the meaning of it? It's a picture. We like pictures, right? We do way better with pictures. And it's a picture for us. It's saying, I'm burying the old life, right? I'm, I'm burying the old life, the life without meaning, the life without purpose, the life with all the bitterness and anger and all those things. I'm burying the old life, and now I'm rising again or coming up to a new life because I have been redeemed. I've been purchased by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus Christ has paid for my freedom, and I am living proof that he can give you a brand new life, a life that's free, and you can experience that too. So this better life is filled with meaning, it's freed, from, freed by grace, but it's also, number three, full of energy. The better life is full of energy. We live in a society that is constantly on the move, constantly. And a few years ago, in Ridgewood, New Jersey, uh, the mayor of Ridgewood, New Jersey, she came up with this idea. She said, you know what? She said, we are overextended she was quoted as saying, we're overextended and we're victims of our own success. Well, don't be too humble, right? Victims of our own success. And so she said, this is what we're going to do. On such and such date, we're going to have a night where there are no sports activities. All the stores in town are going to close. And we're not going to have anything open. Nobody's doing anything. We're taking a night off. So she titled the, the night, Ready, Set, Relax. That doesn't even sound exciting to me. Like, that makes me tense. Like, what am I supposed to do to relax, right? Like, so ready, set, relax. That was the, the title of this night. And so they planned a night basically where nothing was planned. Here's the irony in that. Residents were so addicted to activity that they didn't know what to do with all their free time. So they asked the city to come up with suggested activities for them. Ridiculous, right? Others, they decided they wanted to turn it into a competitive night to see who could have the best family night in town and then go around and judge it. No wonder they're out of energy all the time. No wonder we're out of energy all the time because we do the same kind of thing. Remember pagers, beepers? Anybody have a pager, beeper? Yeah, right? I had one of those, you know, and you get all the fancy little colored cases and all those fun things. Well, one night... Um, one, I can't even remember how many years ago this was now, but one night, <laughs> that's bad. One night, um, my pager went off, and it said 773, and it had a few other little things in between that I couldn't really make out, and it said 07. 773, some garbled numbers, and 07. And I thought, well, I can't call that number back. I don't, I don't know what that is, 773-07. So I, I'm thinking about it, and I, I finally was like, I'm going back to sleep. And so then the pager went off uh, about 20 minutes later. It says the same thing, 773, some stuff, and then 07. And I thought, man, this person really wants me, but I can't call them back because I can't, you know, I, I don't know what number it is. And so it happened a third time. I went to sleep, and it happened a third time. By now I'm thinking, there must be an emergency, right? I, I've got to figure out. So I, at the time, I still had one of those nifty little um, index books where you keep people's phone numbers and things like that. So I'm like looking through for a 773 number, trying to figure out who's calling me. Now we just pull our smartphones out and we can figure it out, right? But I'm looking through and I can't figure it out and I'm getting frustrated because I'm like, what if there's something wrong and I can't call this person back? So I finally, I just, I turned it off and I went back to sleep. The fourth time it went off, I finally, I was, you know, I was so tired, but the fourth time it went off, I took it and I looked at it and I was like, wait, I'm reading this upside down. So I turned the pager over and it just said low cell right? Low cell. What does that mean? Your battery is dying, okay? I needed to replace the battery. But I was worried that there was something wrong. I'm thinking, somebody's got an emergency. I can't call them out, call them back. But I finally, the fourth time, I'm like, oh, I'm looking at it wrong. I turn it over. Yeah, low battery. <laughs> What's the point? Why is he telling us this story on Easter Sunday, right? Listen, have you noticed that when you're low on energy, the little problems in your life become big problems? Have you noticed that when you don't have a lot of patience because your energy is low, the smallest, littlest things just really tick us off? Do you ever get the feeling that you're, that the, do you ever get the feeling that there's a beeper going off in your life over and over and over and you know something's wrong, but you don't know what it is? That was me. 
I knew something was wrong. This person was trying to get me over and over and over, but I couldn't figure out what it was. I turned it over, figured out what it was. But sometimes in our lives, we feel like there's a beeper going off and there's something wrong and we can't quite put our finger on it. I'll tell you what it is. You're running on your own energy and your battery is about to go out. You've been trying to run on your own energy and your battery is about to die. It's no wonder you're tired all the time. God meant for you to live life plugged into his power. Not just go through life living on your own energy. The Bible says in Jeremiah, those who feel tired and worn out will find what? New life and energy. New life and energy. And then in Zechariah 4, 6, it says, you will not succeed of your own strength or power. God wants you to succeed. And he says, you won't succeed on your own strength or power, but what? By my spirit, says the Lord. Oh, you can't answer that one because it's not up there. There it is. <laughs> but by my spirit. We don't succeed by our own strength. We don't succeed by our own power. We succeed by his power, by his spirit. God wants you to plug in to his power this morning. And here's the good news. The same power that he demonstrated when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead, when he came back to life, to prove that he was God. That same power is available to you and to me today. Romans chapter 8, Paul tells us that. He says, once the Spirit lives within you, he will bring to your whole being new strength and vitality. God wants to give you a life full of energy. So you've got a choice that you have to make. You can go through the rest of your life living the good life, disconnected from God's power, or you can live the better life plugged into God's power. It's your choice. Whichever one you choose, you're still going to have problems. Because listen, life is a series of problems. If you haven't figured that out by now, you will eventually. Life is a series of problems. The difference is with God in your life, with Christ in your life, you have the energy to, that, that you didn't have on your own power. With God or, and, and Jesus in your life, you've got unlimited power sources. An unlimited power source to feed energy to your life that you don't have on your own power. The Bible says this, even though on the outside it often looks like things are falling apart on us, on the inside, where God is making new life, not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. You may have come to Easter service today a little tired. You may have come to Easter service today a little bit worn out. You may be on edge. You may have felt like giving up. Maybe you're in a relationship and you feel like giving up on that relationship. Maybe your marriage is falling apart and you're at the point where you just feel like you're going to give up and, and throw in the towel. Maybe it's getting worse by the day and you feel like giving up. Or maybe you feel like giving up on your job. Or maybe you feel like giving up on school. Or maybe you feel like giving up on health because things just aren't improving the way that you want them to. Maybe you feel like giving up on that, that child that's headed in the wrong direction. Or maybe you feel like giving up on your goals and your hopes and your dreams. I'm here to tell you this morning, don't do it. Don't give up. Instead, look up. Look up to God. Don't give up. Give in. Give in to Christ this morning and say, Jesus, I'm going to start living for you and not for me. He'll give you new power. He'll give you new energy. He'll give you new strength to do the things that he puts you here on this earth to do. He'll give it to you on a daily basis, not just Monday, Wednesday, Friday, not just Tuesday, Thursday, not just one day a week on Sunday. He'll give it to you on a daily basis, minute by minute, hour by hour, every day. Not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. Has God been trying to get your attention? I would say, I think so. I think so. I think that's why he brought you here to Morningside Church on Easter Sunday, 2018, so that he could say to you this morning, the good life is not good enough. God says to you this morning, I want you to step up from the good life to the better life. I want you to step up to the life that you were intended and created to live from the very beginning. You say, it sounds great. How do I get it? How do I get this life of meaning and energy and, and purpose and freedom? Again, as I said earlier, you can't earn it. All you have to do is accept it. It's a gift. So you have faith, and you believe, and you receive. The Bible says everybody comes alive in Christ. It's in a relationship to Jesus that you, you're going to get this better life. A relationship with your creator. You don't get it through religion. You don't get it through going to church once a year, twice a year, or every, even every Sunday. You don't get it that way. 
You get it through a relationship with God, your creator. In fact, Jesus said this in the book of John 10.10, 10, I came so that you can have real and eternal life, a better life than you ever dreamed of. One, uh, another version says, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That's why he came. Instead of feeling empty and enslaved and exhausted, he says, I want you to have new meaning. I want you to have freedom. I want you to have energy. That's what Easter is all about. It's not about the crowds. It's about personally getting to know God. Nathan's going to come back. I'm, we're going to close with one more song that he's got for us that's really, really good. And I'm going to close today with a prayer that you can pray to begin living the better life. And it's a prayer that I prayed many, many years ago. I haven't always been a believer. There's, there was a day in my life when I said, you know what? The good life is just not good enough. There has to be more. I want to start living the better life, the life that God created for me and God intended for me to li live. And so I stepped across the line. And I made that choice. And you don't have to pray this prayer out loud. God knows your heart. He knows the very thoughts that you're thinking. In fact, he's seen every thought that you've ever had. That, that could be a scary thought for us, right? But God knows all. And he's seen every thought that we've ever had. So what this is, what this prayer is, is really an attitude of your heart. So say to God this morning as we bow our heads and close our eyes. Say to God this morning, me too, God. I want to start living for you instead of living for me. So first I'm going to pray for you, and then you can follow me in a prayer this morning. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I would encourage you to, to, to prayerfully consider praying this prayer after I pray for you. So let's pray right now. Father, there are people here today who I know have never begun a relationship with you. They know about you. They believe in God. That's partly why they're here. They believe in God. They just haven't ever really known you. I pray this morning, Jesus, that you would give them the courage to open their hearts to you and their mind to you and their life to you right now, God. Now, if you're here this morning and you've never accepted God's free gift, of salvation, I would encourage you to pray something like this right where you sit. Whether you say it out loud or you say it in your heart and it's the attitude of your heart, just pray something like this. Dear God, I want to start living the better life. I realize that you made me for more than just the good life. So as much as I know how, I want to start living for you today and not for myself. Thank you, God, for loving me. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross for my sins and rise again on the third day. I don't understand everything, but I know that you'll explain it to me, God. Today I open my life to you, I give my life to you, and I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that you are Lord. And I ask you today, God, to take control of my life. As best I know how, I want to get to know you. I invite you to be the manager of my life, the CEO of my life. You call the shots from now on, God. I want to exchange the good life today for the better life in Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me today. Thank you for rising again so that I might have eternal life with you and live the better life. Today, Jesus... I choose you because you first chose me. In Jesus' name I pray.